like, wow, guys, I'm, um, I've thought in my head about five to 600 times, it seems like, what I was going to say when I first got up here, and um, I'm just completely wrecked right now. Um, what I experienced here last week or on, on Wednesday, youth night last week, and then tonight um, is just something I've not seen in a group y'all's age. It's so refreshing, and there's the treatment, the welcome. I have to just say thank you so much to all of you, especially Pastor Tyler, Pastor Brandon, for giving me this chance, uh, thinking about it before I came up here, and just the love I'm getting and thinking about my life. I just remember thinking and told my wife, I don't deserve any of this. Um, I don't deserve any of this, but the Lord has put me in this position, and to tell a story, and um, so that's what I'm here to do, but I just want to say thank y'all so much. Y'all have been just absolutely amazing, and um, I can't say that enough. So what we're talking about tonight, addiction, that's pretty much summed up my life uh, for, for many years, starting from a young age, 13 years old, um, first experimented with weed, and I just want to give y'all a heads up. You know, I, I told the pastors as well, I will be... Not graphic, but I'm going to be real with y'all, um, especially what's happening in here and just the emotion I'm feeling. I mean, I've been crying. I've been, I'm not trying to hide that. It's been, um, yeah, it, it, I'm completely just a wreck once again. So I'm going to try to just get through it. Um, but talking about addiction the last few days, I've been kind of thinking about, sorry, I've been crying, so I'm uh, going to have the sniffles. Um, thank y'all. But I've been thinking about, in terms of giving my testimony, I've done this before, but not just giving my testimony and telling you all the things that have happened to me and the ways I've been saved and, and, and the way that God has even kept me and spared me to be here today, which is a miracle in itself, but also thinking about all the people I've met in my life, the rehabs I've been to, jails, and seeing all these people that were addicted and what the common denominator was, or at least one of them. Um, as many of y'all know, addiction runs through everyone. I mean, it's not it, it, the rich, the poor, uh, different cultures, different upbringings, you know, people that have grown up in abusive homes, people that had great homes, great lives, right? Um, it is not discriminatory at all. But I was thinking, and I, I felt the Lord just kind of put on my heart something that I always remember hearing every time someone gave their testimony was, growing up at an early age, I... I don't, I didn't feel like I fit in, you know, I felt different. Um, so we're talking about kind of a, an identity problem, right? Not knowing truly who they are, where do they fit in, trying to find something that makes them feel uh, like they do fit in. And this thought kind of came to me, and I told Tyler the other day, like, maybe someone said this before, I've never heard it, um, but it kind of came to me, and it was, if the devil can confuse you, he can abuse you. And... What I'm talking about there is not just being confused about, you know, something everyday life or whatever, but I mean confused in terms of who are you, right? Who are you? Um, and the devil knows that if you truly find your identity in Christ and you're rooted in Christ, that doesn't change. It's a solid rock. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So if you find that identity in Christ and you're rooted in Christ, he cannot abuse you in those ways because you know who you truly are and whose you are, right? But I think what we see so much, especially in the youth and what we're seeing now on a major scale is confusion all over, even now to the point where being confused about even basic things that we would have never thought people would be confused about, right? And I'm not here to talk about all that, but it does factor in. And so I think about growing up and that same story, um, not really knowing where I fit in, kind of trying to seem like, you know, I'm cool with these people, I fit in with the athletic crowd or the, the people that play music, and I was seeking, kind of just drifting, seeing what felt right. Um, and that led me to, I want to just kind of start with my first experience with trying any drugs, which is common, what you'll hear is, is smoking weed. Um, it seems harmless to a lot of people, but um, I remember doing that with my neighbors and really thinking back on it, I did that simply just to fit in, to, to think like, 
these are my neighbors. They're two brothers that are older. Um, they would think that I'm cool, right? Like I would kind of fit in somewhere. It would give me some type of identity to say, hey, I fit in with these guys. I smoke weed now. Um, so I did that, and what I found was when I did that, I realized this gives me some type of, you know, it numbs my emotions. It numbs my feelings and really didn't have to think about a lot of the things that I was dealing with at that time. And a big thing was my identity, not knowing who I was or whose I was. Um, my mom was always very spiritual, still is to this day, but that is not something that uh, I really ever cared about, uh, never even really tried to, to find Christ. I, I thought, honestly, at times she was crazy. Um, but growing up, after I started to smoke weed, it just kind of led to one thing after another. And what you'll find is little things that y'all do right now, little little decisions you make that seem harmless but are sinning against God, but, or maybe even just doing something your parents told you not to or something you know is wrong, the more that you get comfortable making those decisions now, the easier the enemy can, can convince you to make decisions later that can lead to destruction and death. Okay, so don't think any decision you make that is wrong is harmless. None of them are. Um, and that's something I noticed. As soon as I made that decision to smoke weed, it was like now I smoke weed. Now I'm, 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 a, I'm a guy that, you know, does, does the things I'm not supposed to do. I'm a drug user. I'm a, I'm a pot smoker. And next thing you know, it led to now drinking and just trying to fit in. I literally was just like a follower trying to find a place to fit in and be cool. And that is the story you will most commonly hear from, from drug addicts. Um, I remember us going to parties, and people would drink. And I'll be honest, I hated the taste of alcohol. And so uh, being how I was and who I was, there's no way I was going to go to that outside party in the middle of some woods um, and, you know, not do something. And so I found at my buddy's house, um, his mom had a pill bottle up in the, the cabinet that it said may cause drowsiness or something along those lines. And so I grabbed it, didn't even know what it was. And thinking back on that, that's absolutely insane um, because I could have killed myself easily. And I took a handful of them and said, okay, well, this will be a substitute, you know, maybe for, for drinking. Like I'll still be messed up and cool with everyone, but I won't have to drink. And let's just say the mission was uh, complete. It, it worked, mission accomplished. Um, I became the life of the party because I was passing out. They would wake me up, and I would tell them a 30-minute dream that I had in 30 seconds. And I was literally like the laughing stock of the party. Um, but honestly, the next day, I woke up, and I was like, okay, wow, I don't have to drink. I don't have to experience that taste. I can just, you know, pop a couple pills. And I'll just say that's when things definitely accelerated. Um, it went from that to pretty much trying just about any and every recreational drug. I wouldn't say every at that point, but y'all keep in mind, this is when I'm, you know, 14, 15 years old. Um, I played basketball. I loved basketball. Basketball was my life and something that I didn't even think about that I'll mention on that, that reflecting back when I was in rehab, one of the six times, um, I became very good at rehab. And so one of those times, I remember reflecting back and saying, even from an early age, even the, the things that I thought were good, I still turned them into an unhealthy um, hobby or an unhealthy thing because I would just almost um, overly give my life to 100%, 110%, whatever. So even basketball, I would play every day, all day, and it's like if I wasn't good enough, though, then I felt like that was it. Like that, that was my self-image was I'm not good enough, I'm not as good as this guy or that guy, but I would still every day play. So I always had an addictive personality, if that's what you want to call it. I always kind of, when I found something, I went for it. Um, now, later in my life in business, that's helped in ways, but it's still an unhealthy thing that you have to um, break because if not, you will, you will somehow turn something healthy into something unhealthy, and I, I think y'all need to hear that tonight. But as the drug use progressed, I'm going to just try to speed through some of my testimony because it would take a very long time to tell y'all everything. But... Um, I basically started doing, like I said, recreational drugs of all kinds, started using in school, um, and became a real problem. And so eventually, I think junior year, I was actually kindly asked to leave Portland High School. So I'm, how many of y'all go to Portland High School? Wow. 
So that's crazy, just thinking about how God would turn something like that into something good tonight where I can be here and talk to kids that go to a school that I, I basically got kicked out of for drugs, and now I'm up here giving a platform to speak to y'all. Um, that's all God. That's all Jesus. Um, but basically, at that point, teachers and students, as is, is sly and sleek as I thought I was or uh, sneaky, apparently I was not at all. Teachers and students uh, both were catching on, and they had been keeping a, a file, a record of me um, with things, accusations of things that I'd been doing, drugs that I'd brought in, drugs I was selling. Some were true, some were not. But um, I got kindly, again, asked to leave. And at that point, I convinced my mom, funny story but not funny, um, my mom was actually a teacher in Sumner County for a long time, and I actually convinced her that I just wanted to go homeschool because the high school was making wrongly, or, you know, wrongly accusing me of things. And she actually put me in homeschool and did not know that I got kicked out of high school until literally a few years ago. Um, so talking about being a master manipulator or being able to kind of you know, work people, that's all part of addiction. Um, and so, but basically, once I went homeschool, things went really, really, really south. Um, I basically did not do schoolwork. Another friend of mine who had done the same thing went homeschool. I started just hanging out with him every day. He'd pick me up, and we would go. And um, around this time, I found, and I'm just going to say the name of it, I found a drug called OxyContin, and it changed my life in the worst way you could ever imagine. Um, I will never forget that night. I will never forget doing that, that drug and just feeling like this is it. I'm home. Like that's the best way I can explain it. It was like this is the feeling that I've been chasing and I finally found it. Because again, remember, my identity was, was, was nothing. It, it, it was nothing solid. It was nothing firm. So I was just drifting, searching, seeking to find something. I finally found it. Unfortunately, I found it in a drug that is very expensive, very addictive, and deadly. Um, so at that point, I mean, what, 16, junior in high school, uh, go home school, get addicted to OxyContin. Next thing you know, within a week, I'm selling everything, I'm pawning everything, I'm literally anything and everything I could get my hands on that I could sell, I was selling it just to get my next high, okay? And I want you all to kind of think back and say that all started with making a decision to try to identify with another group of kids to say, I want to smoke some weed with y'all, even though really I didn't. I just wanted to because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to feel like, hey, I'm cool with y'all. Y'all are cool with me. But I look back at that now, and I see youth that are rooted in Christ, and they have a relationship with Jesus, and they have actually studied the word. Um, this is medicine right here for our souls, our spirits. The word of God is so much more than just a book, and I know y'all are young, and it seems Sometimes not, you know, maybe, maybe super cool to, to sit down and read the Word of God, but I'm telling you, if you just do it, it will turn from just reading words on a page to actually being medicine for your spirit and your soul. Uh, it will do things that nothing else can do. No church coming to church won't do. Church does a lot, and this church is amazing. Like, I'm blown away. But there's something in, in this right here, this book, if you want to call it that, um, that changes us over time. And, and so I think back on what would my life have been had that been the case, had I found Christ, had I been rooted in that. But I know now God did all this for a reason, and that's why I'm here today to share my testimony and some of my suffering so that hopefully y'all can get something out of it and not have to go through what I went through. So at this point, the OxyContin addiction was, um, I mean, as bad as it can be. I don't need to go into details of that. But one thing is I always told myself, okay, I'll never do this. Yes, I do this, but I'll never do this, right? Okay, now I do this, but I'll, I'll never do this. So one of those things was I'll never inject, you know, anything into my arm. I'll never use a needle. So I'm, a, I'm doing okay. I know some people that do that. I'm doing okay. I, I won't do that. Well, let me just tell you as soon as, again, if you do something outside of the will of God, you do something that the enemy has a, has a, has a win over you for you doing that or making that decision, the more it gets comfortable, don't ever tell yourself you won't do the next thing. Um, because again, all you're doing is setting yourself up in that trap. The devil does not come and, and take anyone from never abusing a substance or drug or alcohol in their life and get them to inject methamphetamine or heroin the first time they do something. It's a small progression usually, right? And so what seems harmless, you're starting, it's just weed, it's just a vape. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, 
I'm telling you, those decisions right now, those addictions right now will lead for at least a good percentage of you, and I don't say this to scare you, but it will lead to something something stronger, something worse, and something that could once again lead to death. Even if it doesn't lead to actual physical death, it leads to spiritual death, which is worse, okay? Um, But at this point, I I can't tell you my life was just out of control. Uh, My mom, God bless her heart, I I mean, was in denial. My stepdad and I didn't have a great relationship at that time. I watched my brother who was older than me and one, uh, have one sister that's older than me as well. As we got older, my stepdad just really couldn't uh, handle our generation, I guess you would say. So, so things at home were not good, and I was always someone that I hated confrontation. I hated anything that just felt like if people were arguing or if someone was upset with me, that always affected me more than the next person. Um, and that's something still to this day that now God has kind of guided me with and used it spiritually. But so during this time, I eventually, next thing you know, without even realizing it, now I'm injecting drugs. I'm using needles. And so you're like, okay, that's the, I mean, that's it. That's about as bad as you can get. That's kind of rock bottom. Well, I'll let you know I found about 10 rock bottoms. And uh, I've, I've dug a few extra ones when, when the bottom hit and, and dug another one and dug another one. So um, rock bottom is something you can hit, but don't think you can ever dig another one and hit a little lower. Um, but during this time, as I got a little older, I ended up going to rehab my first uh, time in rehab was in Alabama, was in Bradford. Um, I got sent there the day that my classmates, like you all, were walking the line graduating. So my classmates, and, and kind of a part I missed or, or didn't talk about was um, while I was being homeschooled, I started to live with a band. A guy, I was a drummer with a band, some guys that were older than me, um, some guys actually that some of y'all's parents went to school with. It's kind of crazy, but... Um, I started living with them and playing the drums with them, and my love for basketball went away. I quit playing basketball. I only played music, and the drug use, again, was out of control. So I'm addicted to opiates, I'm addicted to Oxycontin, I'm doing other stuff, living with a group of older guys while all the rest of my classmates are in high school, junior year. Um, At 17, I experienced my first loss of of a dear friend of mine. Um, The bass player, who was actually my brother's best friend growing up, and a dear friend of mine, someone that I looked up to like a role model. And I'd finally gained this, this man's um, respect as a friend, not just the little brother of, of my older brother. And um, we were there one day and partying and doing a lot of drugs, and everything seemed normal. And he went to sleep, and we woke up the next morning to his brother. He had a younger brother um, screaming and ran upstairs, and he was stiff as a board, dead, you know, purple. His body already changing, changing colors. He had um, basically drowned in his own vomit. I say all this because that's, that's the reality of it. You know, the society we live in now, especially the music and everything, they set it up to seem really attractive until now you're staring at a, a man that you literally just spent a week with as he was on vacation from work and everyone else was going to college and I was there doing nothing spent a week with this man and had the best, what I thought the best time of my life because this guy was like a role model to me and I wake up and he's dead. I literally couldn't process that. I got interrogated by police. I got, uh, the whole situation was very bad. So that point led to me now, my sister and brother-in-law taking power of attorney over me. They said, this is out of hand. Mom is in denial about this. We got to take over and do something. They took power of attorney over me and I ended up finishing my senior year uh, went to Gallatin High School. I'll just tell you all right now, going to a, a brand new school your senior year where you know nobody, it's not, not the greatest thing in the world to do. Um, I went in there and basically just kept my head down, and I, I lived as a drug addict for an entire year somehow under the, I guess, uh, authority of my brother and sister-in-law, or my brother-in-law and sister. And let's just say that did not last long. Here I am going from living three years with a backpack uh, I had a blue bag from the age probably of 15 to 17, and I would just go to friends' house. I would drift. I would sleep on couches. I would just go wherever. And um, I would sell drugs to make money, to buy more drugs, and just do whatever I had to do. So going from that to now having you know, a former Marine who was my brother-in-law and then my sister kind of trying to now take me in and, and, and really like you know, have these rules and guidelines, it did not work well. 
I bucked pretty hard and um, ended up basically just, just moving out. And that's when I found myself in rehab. So just to give you all a little backstory on that. Um, so my first time in rehab, let's just say I got clean, I got out, I thought everything was good, and it wasn't. I started drinking because I said I'm not a drinker, right? That's normal. We go to a party, my friends are there, we're like 18 now. That's normal, not a big deal, and I'm not a drinker. I'm a drug addict. I'm an opiate addict. Well, we drink one night, and then the next day, I'm like, hey, let's drink again. And my friends are like, okay, yeah. And then the next night, I'm like, let's drink again. And they're like, hey, dude, I got I to go home. Um, yeah, I got stuff to do, whatever. I found myself drinking every night, waking up in people's yards, um, completely just waking up, feeling terrible, hungover. And I just remember saying, man, this ain't it. You know, if I'm going to be doing something, I'm going to go back to to my drug of choice. And that is, again, another trick of the enemy. Another trick of addiction is, hey, you're not this, so it's okay to do this. Well, he'll find a way to, to, to take that and lead you back to what you, what you know is, is your uh, drug of choice or substance. It could be porn. It could be gambling. I mean, whatever it is. Um, but I went through a phase, just to kind of fast forward a lot, I went through a phase of rehab, getting out, getting clean, doing well for just a little bit, going back, hitting another rock bottom, selling drugs, running drugs for a a gang at one point, doing just things that, I mean, literally living a life of as much chaos and sin as you could possibly imagine. I can't even go into it all right now. But what I did want to talk about is during that time, as I got a little older into my 20s, I had my first experience of of a true overdose and I want to tell this story because it wasn't until, honestly, probably a year ago that it hit me just how insane it is that I'm alive today. Um, I actually remember we were watching a movie at my house, and I remember thinking there was a movie. It was one of the God's Not Dead movies, and we were watching, and I was like, man, I wish I had, like, something in my life that had happened that's like a supernatural miracle that made me have this, like, insane, crazy faith that some of these people have, right? Right? And when I tell you, the Lord kind of slapped me upside the head and was like, took me into my prayer closet and was like, what are you talking about? And he ran me through, I I can't even explain it, but it's almost like I could see what was happening even while I was pronounced technically dead, unconscious. And he kind of ran me through it and was just like, do you not see? Your life is a miracle. What happened is a miracle. You should not be alive. And... um, it's just something before I would tell the story and just not really think much of it, and, and now I see it for what it truly is. And, uh, but that all started. I was actually going to pick up my oldest daughter. I was in a parking lot in Nashville and pulled up, was waiting on her, and y'all are going to hear some things that are going to make you like, man, this dude was a terrible dad, and I'm not hi- I don't hide from it. I don't do anything. I want y'all to hear that because, A, I want you, if any of you have parents that are struggling with addiction, I want you to know that the addiction can, can, can take things from them and make them do things that um, you will think they literally care nothing about you, but just know there is hope in Jesus and there is hope um, today because if I'm here. I pull up in, in, in a kind of shady parking lot. And I was waiting to later that day pick up my daughter from um, her mother. And I had got some heroin. At this point, I was a heroin addict. I was not only shooting heroin, I was shooting methamphetamine or cocaine with it. Um, I was adding things even into that, that even drug dealers were telling me, you have a death wish, man. You got to stop. This is crazy. Um, just to let you know, that's not a good sign when, when your drug dealers are telling you that. And I pulled up that day, and I will never forget, I had, I had got the drugs, the heroin, and I was sitting there and I was fixing to do what I was going to do. And I won't go into full details, but I just remember looking at that after I had done multiple, whatever, fixes of heroin and thinking, this is going to kill me. Like I knew, I literally knew um, how dark it was, how much I'd pulled up. I, it was, I knew, I remember saying, I cannot do all of this. And just to show you how strong the grips of addiction is, I remember putting it in my arm, and I pushed in half of it. And again, I know this is graphic. I'm sorry, but I pushed in half of it, and I stopped, and I've never done that. And I stopped, and I told myself, probably should save the rest of this and not do the rest. And then I said, no, it's all good, and pushed the rest in. At that point, I will never forget 
a few seconds went by, and I felt what, what I call um, a black wave of death. It's the best way that I can describe it, and it started at my feet, and it literally came tingling, making all of my body numb. It started at my feet and came all the way up my body, and it right here at my chest, I remember saying two words, oh, and you can use your imagination for what that is, but I, I said those words, and then it just went black. Um, everything went black. I don't know how much time even passed, but I just remember at some point waking up to four paramedics carrying me by my legs and my arms, and they're trying to wake me up. They're trying to keep me alert. They're asking me questions. Who is the president? Who is this? Who is that? And um, basically, I go out again. So at this point, I had flatlined. They had hit me with Narcan. They had actually... Uh, fractured or done something to my sternum here from hitting it so hard from trying to get air into my lungs. And long story short, as, as short as I can, I end up in the ICU unit in St. Town Mid Thomas or St. Thomas Midtown. And I'm in the ICU unit and I'm not waking up feeling like, thank you, Lord, you saved my life. I'm actually mad, two things, because I got a charge. They charged me for the, the rest of my drugs that I had just bought. So I was very mad about that because all the rest of it I knew got wasted. And I was ungrateful. And I remember saying, why in the world did you not just let me die? Because I had been to a point where I knew for, a, for certain I would die with a needle in my arm. And I was completely okay with that. Or at least I felt I was. The devil was okay with that. And at that point, the devil unfortunately kind of ruled my life through addiction. And I was sitting in the ICU unit and there was a cop outside because I'd been charged, so he was waiting for me to get dismissed because he would have to take me to jail. And one of the paramedics came and basically came back and said, asked the cop, hey, could I come in and just speak to him? This is off record. This is off. You know, I'm not here. Um, I just want to talk to him for a minute. And so he came in and he said, son, I have to ask you a question. He said, do you remember putting your car, when you were parked, do you remember putting your car in reverse at any point when you were sitting there? And I said, what? Like, no. I had no idea what he was talking about. And at that point, I'm like, wow, what, what happened? What's going on with my car? And he said, don't worry about your car. It's fine. He said, I already felt like I knew the answer. But son, I just have to tell you, you have an angel of God watching over you. You should be dead. We can't stop talking about it. The paramedics can't stop talking about it. And I just drove, basically he drove an hour out of his way after his shift to come to me, to tell me you have an angel of God watching over you. And I don't know what he kept you alive for but basically it's something because you should be dead. And so I'm going to give you all some insight on what happened, which is still blows my mind. First of all, my Nissan Altima, the shift lock or whatever was broke. So to literally shift my car, if any of y'all ever had this, to shift my car from park, out of park into reverse or any other, you had to push something down, a pin or anything I could find, push it down and then pull it, right? My car was in park. I was not leaving at all. I was parked up against a big concrete wall away from everyone else in that parking lot. I did that, and literally immediately when they found me, the needle was still on my arm, and the tourniquet was still tied to my arm. And I say that just to say I wasn't going anywhere. Somehow, after this happened, as I'm unconscious, as I'm dying, my car shifts into reverse, starts slowly backing up because nobody was hitting the gas pedal, so it just kind of starts rolling and eventually rolled, 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 and hit one of the, the poles in the parking lot, the light poles, and then someone saw and was like, hey, dude, you just wrecked your car. Oh, my gosh, he's dead or, you know, dying. And they called paramedics, and they got there barely in time to save me. So you tell me <laughs> if any of you don't know if God does miracles or if God decides in the end who, who is going to come or who's going to stay. And I'm going to try to be quick because there's one more, Then I just have something on my heart I want to say, and I'm sorry to y'all. I pretty much knew I was probably going to go over time. But I did not care about that at that point. That was not the wake-up call I needed, apparently. I was instead mad, and I left that night from the hospital. They dismissed me. I convinced the cop that I would turn myself in the next day. I did that twice, by the way, and ended up getting cops all at my house to arrest me eventually. But um, and ended up calling the same drug dealer that had actually sold me the stuff that killed me that apparently I found out later on actually told someone else that it was dirty. Um, and it's crazy now because that man that lived in the projects in Nashville, he now runs a, tr a huge treatment center. So praise God for that. But um, I, I, yeah, praise God. But I called, 
I called that same man that night at about two in the morning getting released from the hospital. I said, dude, they got my stuff. I need some more. And he said, dude, what is wrong with you? Go home. And so again, getting turned down by a drug dealer, my life was pretty bad. The addiction was about as bad as it could be. It ran my life. It ran my thoughts. It ran everything about me. I did not care about the fact that I just had a miracle happen and God just spared me and saved my life when I watched so many others around me die the first time that they overdosed. At this point, I had overdosed probably 10 times. I flatlined actually three of those times, meaning my heart stopped. Um, The first time I just told you about, there's only one more I really want to talk about. Um, But the second time, I had actually been doing good. I finally got my life together a little bit. I was about to go to either prison or drug court. (laughs) So I took drug court, um, thinking, absolutely, that's the choice. Well, it's a little bit harder than I thought. Um, So I I went into drug court. They were drug testing me all the time, classes. I mean, it's about as strict as it can get. And I was doing well for a while, and then I started getting in trouble. Little things, little things that I would break rules. I would get sanctioned and put back in jail for a weekend or have to go to classes because I had an authority issue. Um, So I I wanted to make my own rules, and any rules they gave me, I wanted to break. But after drug court, uh, about a year, I ended up being at a friend's house that I used to stay at and um, basically was doing good, was clean, found out I was going to get in trouble. My dad was dying of cancer at the time, and I had drank some wine with him kind of during his last days. And somehow Tracy Bryant, the director of drug court, who is uh, probably not my biggest fan, hopefully she is now, I don't know, I haven't talked to her since I ran from her, but um, (laughs) uh, true story. But basically at that point, I said, man, it was a Friday, and we go in front of the judge on Mondays, and I said, dude, they're going to put me back in jail for something like this. I'm going to give them a reason to put me back in jail. Once again, the devil's tactics. He's very sneaky. He's very clever on how he does these things. So I said, that makes sense, right? I'll show them. I'll show them that I'll almost kill myself, but I'll show them. I'll really show them who's in control here. So basically, I ended up going and getting some heroin, and I was set on I was going to relapse. It was a Friday evening. My daughter came over on the weekend, so she was there with me and the guy that lived at the house that used to let me stay with him. He did not do drugs, but um, so we're there. She comes over, and I said, I won't shoot it. I won't inject it. As long as I don't shoot it, since I've been clean, that's the quickest way people die. They go to rehab. They get clean. They don't find Christ. They try to work some program, but there ain't no steps other than the one step, and that is receiving Christ. I'm telling you right now, so... They get out, and now, again, they don't know where they're going. They don't know who they are, and they, they relapse, and they die because now their tolerance has dropped, but their, uh, their, their addiction is still the same, so they go back for the same amount. So anyways, I told myself, if I don't inject it, I'll be fine. I won't die. Well, I did that, and that theory actually worked for a little while, but then I kept doing more. I was snorting heroin that night, and I, I will never again forget these two moments My daughter was laying on the couch. There was a very small one-bedroom apartment. The bedroom where this guy slept and whatever was right here. The living room right here. We slept in here. It was a couch like like an L-shaped couch. My daughter was laying here dead asleep. I went in and I said, I got to finish this stuff because I can't waste it. But if I do it tomorrow, now it'll turn into a whole thing. And I got drug court Monday, so I got to finish it. And I remember trying to finish it. Couldn't even finish it. Did the last bit that I did. I'll just say that. And barely remember walking out of the bathroom, getting back to the couch, apparently somehow. At that point, I overdose. I completely go out again. I'm gurgling for air, I think, every probably 20 seconds. Uh, I'd imagine I've turned colors at this point. Cannot breathe, fighting for breath, and I don't remember any of it. Um, at this point, in, the, in that apartment... There's a big air conditioner, a window air conditioner in that apartment. And so in his room where this guy slept, he could not hear anything from the living room. It's very loud. That air conditioner's in there. He can't hear anything at all. Somehow, something happens, and part of the uh, breaker, one of the breakers somehow randomly tripped in the middle of the night. It's never happened before, and he's, he's told me years later it's never happened again. One part of his room, the outlet stopped working, just one part, and it happened to be one of the outlets that his phone was plugged up into. When the outlet stopped working, the phone just made a little ding that it was no longer charging. 
That woke him up. He looked at his phone. It says it's not charging. It's plugged up. Makes him kind of question, why is it not charging? At that point, he wakes up. He goes over to the breaker box, and he hears kind of a noise. He said probably every, like I said, 20 seconds, he's hearing something weird. He doesn't know what it is. He's trying to see if it's the air conditioner or not. He flips one of the breakers off to flip it back on to reset it, and he hears now from the living room what was me fighting for breath, and at that point actually uh, ended up taking my last breath. And, well, not my fully last, but at that point, my last breath, and he runs in there, and I'm on the floor face down, uh, purple, you know, fighting for my life. And so at that point, I actually flatline again. This was the second time. He starts doing CPR on me. My daughter wakes up. My daughter at this time, I don't even remember, maybe 12, 11. She's the one who actually has to stay on the phone with paramedics until they got there. While her dad is being, CPR is being done on her dad right in front of her that she just woke up out of a dead sleep right? That's what addiction does. That's what addiction is. That's what sometimes thinking it's a harmless to make a decision to vape because your friends are doing it or to smoke some weed because you want to fit in and because who wants to worry about Christ right now? I got the rest of my life ahead of me. I'm young. That's a lie from the devil. When Jesus comes back, there will be a gauge group of y'all age. And I just want to say this is something on my heart. There is no exception in the Word of God that I've ever read that says, if you're only 16, don't worry about it. When he comes back, it's okay. If you know the truth and you know what he came to do and did and you make the decision to walk away from it, there will be a group of youth, y'all's age, when he steps back on the Mount of Olives. So thinking about that, I'm so grateful that that wasn't me, right? But the society we live in today, the devil who runs the little G God of this world, he wants y'all to think you have the rest of your life. Go be dumb, young, and you know, stupid. Go make decisions. Go have sex with whoever. It's okay. You're not ready to settle down right now. I'm telling y'all that is a lie from the enemy because the word says don't get caught partying and hanging out while the master's away because that's as soon as he'll come back. 